Well, good morning, everybody in the Committed 100. Welcome to a special episode of Combined Systematic Theology and Church History. Um, since last week, we were looking at Erasmus and his translation into the Latin, into the Greek, his Dagolot, his uh, multi-translation from the Latin, um, looking at why he included 1 John 5, 7, and specifically today looking at a textual journey of the source documents. What uh, documents did, number one, Erasmus have access to? What documents do we have access to today? What is the, not only what is 1 John 5, 7, what's the history behind it, but then why why is there a large controversy? Why is it that um, people will say, well, your your Bible doesn't have 1 John 5, 7 in it. That means you're going to hell. I've literally heard that, and others have heard that. The, oh, no, if you don't have this Bible right here that has 1 John 5, 7 in it, oh, wow, that's very, very bright, <laughs> uh, then you're going to hell. Well, let's look at that. In fact, this discussion is going to continue on into daylight. We're going to present the evidence and then discuss the evidence, as well as some of the is and isms surrounding this controversy. Uh, with that, hopefully you guys have your cups of coffee, kachink. It's like I put it just a little bit forward and then it comes into the light. Yes. <laughs> uh, sorry about the delay this morning. Um, was setting everything up on the computer. And then all of a sudden, the, just about ready, I'm ready to press the go live button. The uh, router turns off and I have no internet. Go in to go check the internet and the um, hey Vernon Smith, glad you could join us. Uh, the circuit for the router had been popped somehow, it had been reset. So I unplugged the router, put it on a different circuit that was still up and running. Took a few minutes for the router to recycle and then to get everything going on this end. So sorry for being a few minutes late. But with that, let's dive into it because there's a lot to talk about this morning. So this morning, when looking at what's called the Kama Johannium, which is 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, predominantly. Now, there are some variations in the text in verses 6 and 8, but predominantly today we're talking about verse 7. We're going to be talking about what is it, what is the history behind it, and why is there controversy? 1 John chapter 5, verses 6 through 8 uh, in the King James Version. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And this is the spirit that beareth witness, because the spirit is truth. Verse 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three are one. And so the controversy that we're going to be discussing today is surrounding verse 7. Because your more modern translations um, either include it but have a footnote that they do not believe that it's original, or some translations like the NIV skip it entirely and, and have a footnote that it's not in either the oldest or the best um, manuscripts that we have access to. This is where tradition, just a fair warning, this is where we need to check tradition at the door. From this point on, let put, let's put our ists and our isms and our denominational ties and or whatever it is you were told growing up uh, to the side and let's together look at the evidence and then come to an understanding ourselves, because this topic among is one of many, but specifically First John five seven or Textus Receptus only or King James only, is becoming a very large, very heated argument within the Christian community, and I have never seen people get as nasty to each other as I have over this particular subject. <laughs> 
as we go back and, and quickly review what we covered last week with Erasmus's um, Novum Testamentum, in his second t edition, he added one manuscript, so he had a total of eight, all of them dating from the 12th to the 14th centuries. He, he didn't have immediate access to um, Codex Vaticanus, um, but he did have distance access to it through a friend, Bombasius, which we're going to review in just a moment. Erasmus was ridiculed in his uh, first two editions for not including the Comma Johannium, 1 John 5, 7. Erasmus replied that he had not found any Greek manuscript that contained these words. He answered that it, this is a case not of omission, but simply of non-edition. He showed that even some Latin manuscripts did not contain these words, which is correct at this point in time, as Erasmus is doing his Novum Instrumentum or Novum Testamentum. The, the only documents that would have had it were the Latin, and not the older Latin. It would have been newer Latin um, translations or copies included it. And as we're going to look at the textual evidence in just a moment. Erasmus's reaction to this criticism was that he asked his friend Bombasius to check uh, Codex Vaticanus, which was written, uh, since we've been able to date it, from 3 to 325 AD, very, very early. Bombasius sent two excerpts or extracts from the manuscript containing the first beginnings of 1 John 4 and 5. Codex Vaticanus does not include the comma which in um, Erasmus's mind confirmed his non-addition of it in his first two editions of his Novum Testamentum. Um, but there was such an uproar around it because it had become such a tradition within the Latin Vulgate and, and those that had used the Latin translations that he actually, going back on history and talking about this for a moment, Erasmus really focused on the Latin translation. He wanted a new, fresh Latin translation because, remember, by this point, Latin had been used as the Bible for a thousand years. And so in that time, Latin had morphed. Latin had changed. Words were either no longer used or their meanings had changed, just as what happens in English. And so <clears throat> he was in a hurry, number one, to print his editions because there were others doing similar translations, but also it had to get papal approval for anything to sell or to be official. It had to get papal approval. And he was worried that his new Latin translation would cause problems because of the updating of language. He was, I think, Desiderius Erasmus was rather upset at the fact that nobody really commented on his Latin translation. They were worried about the Greek. All of the, the gruff that Erasmus got was over his Greek translation, which is very interesting. But um, Erasmus then went on to say that he would include it if he found a single manuscript that contained it. With the third edition of his text in 1522, the comma Johannium was included. An often repeated story is that Erasmus included it because he felt bound by a promise to include the manuscript, include it if a manuscript was found that contained it. When a single 16th century Greek manuscript, we're going to look at it, Codex Monfortianus, which most scholars agree they can tie it down to a singular year in which it was written, 1520. Notice that the timing of its writing being concurrent with the issues regarding Erasmus and including the comma. Subsequently had been found to contain it. Erasmus included it, although he expressed doubt as to the authenticity of the passage in his annotations um, in his translation. So what is the history Let's take a look at some other ancient translations off of either the Hebrew or the Greek in and around the world at the time. So here in the first, let's say, four centuries of the church, 
You have the, the Bible being written in Greek, which was the predominant language at the time. And then as the persecution ends, 313, the peace of the church, it then moves into Latin. Then as um, those are Christians are going out into the world, spreading the gospel, bringing the good news, it then is being translated into other language, such as Syriac or Coptic or Armenian or Ethiopic or Arabic or Slavonic. What's interesting is most of these translations, except for Arabic and Slavonic, um, are all translated and we have full copies in the 5th and 6th centuries. In fourth, fifth, and sixth centuries, very, very early in the transmission of the text in the New Testament, all of them, a single one, excluding the Latin, do not include the comma, do not include First John five seven. The hundreds upon hundreds of manuscripts that we have of Syriac or Coptic or Armenian do not contain it. It is not until uh, after the 18th century that these translations started to include the comma, mainly because ba -ba -da -ba, the influence of the King James Bible and missionaries who are using the King James Bible. What about early church fathers, you may ask? We looked at early translations, but what about those that would might have quoted 1 John 5, 7, maybe in defense of the Trinity, for instance, or um, against the Sabellians, the modalists. Tertullian and several other new um, early church fathers write about the Trinity, and people assume that they are quoting 1 John 5, 7, but let's look at them and see if they're actually quoting them, or if they're just making a connection themselves of the scriptures. Thus the connection of the Father and the Son, and of the Son the Paraclete, Son in the Paraclete, produces three coherent persons who are distinct from one another. These three are one essence, not one person. As it is said, I and my Father are one, in respect of unity and of substance, not singularity of number. I don't see a specific allusion or quotation of 1 John 5, 7 in this section in Tertullian against Praxis, um, chapter 25. We see him quoting Jesus, I and my Father are one, and him explaining that these three are of one essence, not one person. Basically, the same argument is found in the Council in 325 in discussing the Trinity against the heretics. But I do not see an, an overt or even covert um, reading of 1 John 5, 7 in this. Same thing Tertullian continues to write in chapter 31. What need would there be of the gospel, which is the substance of the new covenant, laying down as it does the law and the prophets lasted until John the Baptist? If thenceforward the Father, the Son, and the Spirit not are not both believed as in three and in making one only God. Is that quoting first John five, seven? No, he's continuing his Trinitarian argument uh, against the Gnostics and against those that we would now call Sabellians. And this is very early in the church. Why wasn't Tertullian just hammering uh, first John five, seven? every other sentence to prove the doctrine of the Trinity. Augustine, 4th century. But as there are two things, the mind and the love of it, when it comes, when it loves itself, so there are two things, the mind and the knowledge of it, when it knows itself. Therefore, the mind itself and the love of it and the knowledge of it are three things, and these three are one. Augustine on the Holy Trinity, Book 9, Chapter 4. Um, is this quoting 1 John 5, 7 as those that advocate for the Texas Receptus, King James Version, and or for the com what's called the comma Johannium? No, I don't see. He's just making a connection of scripture in general, and I don't see him quoting 
1 John 5, 7, as many of the early church fathers would quote, not necessarily directly, because chapters and verses were to come at a later point in time, that sometimes they would say, well, a John has said, and then quote what John has said. But we don't see that here either. Cyprian, who died in 258, very early in the church. This is the number one quoted or quotation to quote unquote prove that the 1 John 5, 7 should be included in the Bible because Cyprian quoted from it. Let's look at it. Who in Treatise 1 section quoted John 10, 30 against heretics who denied the Trinity and added, again, it is written of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And it, again, it is written of. Important words. Uh, it is. He didn't say it is written in John or is written in the scriptures. It's just written of. This would have been a common uh, apologetic argument presented in the early centuries against the heretics. Cyprian is at the early period of fighting against those that would hold to the Arian heresy about Jesus. The heresy against what we call Trinitarianism. And yet, he just says that it's been written up, that there had been other works that had presented this argument of the Father and the Son and the Spirit, and these three are one. He's not quoting John. What is the textual history? We looked at the early church fathers um, in my extensive reading in the early church fathers, and we've read a bunch of the early church fathers here in the Committed 100 in our church history series. When you read the, the voluminous writings against the heretics and against those that deny the Trinity, you do not see a direct quotation. You might see an allusion to the concept, but that could be gathered from just reasoning through the scriptures and to coming to a systematic understanding of presenting that theology. So let's look into where does the comma pop into the text. As we're going to see, it doesn't show up in, in, in the Greek until 1520. But what about the Latin, in which Jerome was mainly, or excuse me, not Jerome, Erasmus was mainly interested in? One of the first ex examples that we see is Codex, Codex Fuldensius uh, in about 546. It contains a copy of Jerome's prologue to the canonical Gospels, which seems to reference the comma, but the Codex version of 1 John omits the comma, which has led many to believe that the prologue's reference is spurious or not original. As we remember, Jerome was the first one to write the official Latin called the Vulgate in and about the 3rd to 4th century. Hey, Terrence. Hey, Mrs. Howard. Hey, Bobby. Glad you guys could join us as we're talking about this very controversial issue that will spill over into daylight. But we see that Jerome's prologue makes a reference to it, but it's not contained in the Vulgate, and it's not contained in Codex Fuldensius, even though in the introduction to um, the book, it makes a, an allusion or a reference to it, but it's not contained in it. Many would say the church fathers alluded to it. We've looked at several of the main arguments for that, quoting Cyprian, what's also called pseudo-Cyprian. We cannot um, fully validate that Cyprian actually wrote those letters. Priscillian, which interestingly enough, those that advocate for the comma Johannium and the Textus Receptus will quote Priscillian, but Priscillian was a heretic. Why are you quoting a heretic to make your point on a biblical passage? Is that really evidence that you want on your side? They quote speculum, vermadum, 
Pseudo Vigilis and, and Ful Codex Fulgentius, which is attributed to Fulgentius, but there's not 100% sure that that's actually the case. But each of these allusions are like the previous ones we already looked at. They're making an argument reasoned from Scripture that the three are one, but none of them say, and John said, or quoting from the letter from John, or letter from the elder, or the letter from the apostle, it's all reasoned presentation of the evidence. What about the early church fathers in controversy? I mentioned this earlier. We see some of the earliest attacks on the Christian faith in the very early centuries are the Arian heresy and the Sabellian heresy. Arians reducing the nature of Christ to less than God and the Sabellians saying that God is modalistic. He turns into the Father, he turns into the Son, he turns into the Spirit. Not a single time in those 400 years of, of controversy is 1 John 5, 7 ever mentioned or used as a proof text. Don't you think if the early church fathers or those at the Council of Nicaea would have grabbed a hold of 1 John 5, 7 and slammed it down on the table, so to speak, as a proof text and said, hey, here, here's where we get our doctrine. It says the three are one that negates the Arian heresy, it negates the Sabellian heresy, and, and every other non-Trinitarian heresy that shows up in the early church. It, it's never mentioned. What about the comma in the Greek? We notice that this became an issue with Erasmus because those people were saying that he needed to include it because of it was contained in the Latin, but it's not contained in the Greek. He said, I would include it if I could find one Greek manuscript that contained it. Well, let's look at this. So we have to remember that uh, we're looking at end of the 1400s, early 1500s, that Erasmus is doing his work on the Novum Instrumentum, the, that becomes the Novum Testamentum. They would say that, well, what about Kozak Wizenbergensis, which many attribute to being Greek, but it's not Greek. It's in Latin which is dated around 750, which would include itself in the other Latin documents at the time as including 1 John 5, 7, predominantly as what's called a gloss or a note either on this margin to the side or the margin below the text itself, not actually in the text of scripture. Now there's a big debate among scholars as to whether that date of 750 is correct for Codec Wizenbergensis. There's also Codex Monfortianus, as we discussed earlier, which was the text presented to Erasmus to include the comma. It's called Minuscule 61, and we can, down to the year, put it at 1520. If that is the first Greek text, as we're going to see, that contains the comma in the body of the text, why did it only show up until 1520? Why was there not a single Greek manuscript that contained it for, well, let's say 1420 years of the church? Also, we see manuscript number 629, which is also called Codex Autobonianus. Some of these names are hard, folks. Which dates to the 14th and 15th century, contemporary with Erasmus and his writing of, once again, the his Latin and Greek translation of the New Testament. We have document 918, 16th century. We have doc document 2318, the 18th century. These are the main Greek documents that we have that contain the comma 
Why so few? Why so late? Why is it that it doesn't enter into the Greek, what we call stream of manuscripts until 1520? Well, I think we know why. What about the comma in the margins of the Greek, which shows up a little bit earlier? What I'm saying is just as we write notes in the margins of our Bibles, or at least some of us do. I have one Bible that I use that has my notes in it, my grandfather's notes in it. All of our notes are in the margins, referencing something that we had learned from God's word. Same way with each of these texts, the comma is included in the margins. Minuscule 88, which comes from the 11th century, which we can date the margins were added. The ink is of a different type and a different strength, shall we say, which dates from the 16th century. So a text from the 11th century, which isn't the oldest that we have, contains it in the margin, but the margin was written at the 16th century. Oh, yeah, um, contemporary, once again, with Erasmus' writing of his translation. Uh, Codex 221, produced in the 10th century, with margins added, once again, in the 15th or 16th century. Um, do you guys see a pattern going on here that it seems that about the 15th and 16th century that when the comma becomes starts to begin its most controversial discussions in the church that is then inserted into every document in which they had access to at the time uh, document number 429 is 14th century with margins added in the 16th century. Same thing with number 636. It was included in the margin in the 16th century. Why is it that we don't see a single Greek manuscript with the comma in the margins before in the first nine centuries of the church? 900 years of it is not including. What about later Greek manuscripts with the comma in inside of the text itself, where it goes verses 6, 7, and 8, and the comma is included in verse 7? Seven. Well, Codex 61, which we call Codex Monfortianus, we know this was produced in 1520. And then it shows up in 629, 14th, 15th century. Codex uh, 630 is included once again, 15th century, 918, 16th century, Codex 2318 and 2473, 18th century. Why is it, once again, that for 1420 years of the church, in the Greek, it doesn't show up either in or as a margin? Or what about... Greek texts that were edited later. So in other words, these are Greek texts in which the comma Johannium, part or in whole, none of these are the codex being, or excuse me, the comma being included the same way. Each of these inclusions has a variation of the comma, whether it is the full verse or parts of the verse, or that it smushes together, so to speak, with verse 6, or becomes a part of verse 8. There is no cookie-cutter model for the common Johannium in these texts. To, to say that is to distort history. Uh, Codex 429, written, well, once again, the 13th century. The 13th century was corrected later. In other words, what do we mean by that? Often, as what would happen, as we're going to see in, in Codex Vaticanus, is that after time, the ink on the page would fade. Just as if we write a letter and we keep it for 50 years, the ink starts fading. Same thing is true with these documents. That then later, 
some monks or scribes would go back and they would go back with a new pen and new ink and trace over the lines that were there to help preserve the document. At that time, whenever it was corrected or retraced, so to speak, that's when the comma would show up. And it's easy to tell because of radiocarbon dating, because of um, electron microscopes, because of being able to put the documents under different types of light. We can see that sometimes some of these documents have had two or three quote unquote corrections in the course of their textual history. And we can tell by the different inks, the different widths of the inks, the different types of inks that were used. Same thing with Codex 221. 10th century document corrected much, much later to include the comma. Or six, number 635, 11th century, corrected later. Then we have the Greek texts that were edited later that add it in the margins. Codex 88 and 177, both 11th century. Marginal gloss, marginal reading was added in the 16th century. Oh, hey, that's the same time we're talking about. It's the same time Erasmus is finishing up his editions. 221, 429, 636, 10th, 14th, and 16th centuries. Why is it that we don't see the comma before the, the 10th century? Or what about the Latin? This, this is where Erasmus got most of his gruff, most of his problems from, um, because the Latin included the comma. But the funny thing is, is the earliest attestation that we have in any Latin text, remember, once again, I said it's not included in Jerome's version of the Latin called the Vulgate. And it's the earliest that it shows up is the 7th century. Even in the Latin. Even in the Latin. So why is it that then 1 John 5, 7, no matter where, whether we're looking at the Greek whether we're looking at the Latin or whether we're looking at any of the other languages in which were translated either from the Greek or the Latin into the Syriac or the Coptic or the Armenian, why is it not a single document? Does the comma show up until the seventh century? Why is it a church father never directly quotes or alludes to first John five, seven? These are important questions to ask. And we're going to be looking at some of the ists and the isms of why people believe that it is original and that other people are going to hell because they don't have it in their Bibles. Uh, these We see the Fragmenta, 7th century again includes it. Then in the 9th century, we see many documents in the 9th century including it. Um, five, especially Codex Complutensis which we can date to exactly 927. And then we see 10th century codexes, including it as a gloss, but not as the original in Codex 63 and Toletanus. Once again, the important thing to notice here is it doesn't show up until the 7th century in the Latin. Well, let's take a look at the earliest Greek manuscripts that we have. The, the most widely attested to, the most widely used, the, the ones in which we can date to, to within a 50-year span. Uh, specifically here is Conex Sinaiticus, as majuscule, which is describing the type of text, which we could call, uh, it's all uppercase. So in this particular instance, this is all uppercase Greek letters. It's dated to the 300s um, between... 3 to 325, depending on which scholar you ask. Now, in the top line, this is the section containing 1 John chapter 5. Uh, this is the beginning. I'm, it's a very large page, and I zoomed in the section that we wanted to look at. Uh, we see here, Hina. I, hopefully you guys can, yeah, you, you should be able to see my mouse. Hina here, 
begins the second half of verse 6. Hina ektin to martyrin. No hoti. This is beginning verse 7. It knew ektin. Martyria, no. For me, personally, this is just a Chris thing here. Majuscule is harder for me to read than minuscule. Minuscule, shall we say, is a mixed where words are capitalized using capital letters, much like in the English and the rest are lowercase. I still have a problem reading majus majuscule. But neither... As it lies, what's interesting is what is we see here between the martyrian here that would be verse 6 and the martyrian here, which, oh, whoops, I'm pointing at the wrong thing, sorry. The martyrian here, second line, and the mar martyrian here, and on the fourth line that we, one, two, three, four, five, fifth line, sorry, that we see here doesn't contain the comma. Why? Because what's missing is what we see right here. Hoti tres estin hoi martyrianates ento orano. Ho pater, ho logos kai to agion numa kai ote oi tres en estin. And these three are one. Those two lines are not contained here in Codex Sinaiticus. Now, I did not include, we're going to look at Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus. Two of the documents in which those that are what's called Texas Receptus only or King James only would accept as legitimate documents because they reject anything coming from Alexandria, Egypt and saying that that, that line of documents is corrupt and purposely edited and are deleted verses. So we're not going to look at Codex Alexandrinus. We're going to look at Sinaiticus and Vaticanus which are considered by them as legitimate. Here in Codex Sinaiticus, the comma is absent. Doesn't exist. Same thing here is Codex Vaticanus in the section on 1 John chapter 5. Also, again, dates to the 300s. This one not nearly as good of a shape as the previous, if we notice. Here's Codex Sinaiticus. I mean, it's readable. It looks great for being you know, thousands of years old. And here's Vaticanus. Now, Vaticanus, like many other manuscripts, has gone through several, shall we say, revisions. It has had at least three, maybe four uh, rewrites where someone has gone through with a quill and ink later and written over the letters as to preserve the documents. That's why... When you look at it, let's get my mouse over here. And you see these three dots over here? And these, this is supposed to be three dots over here. There's two dots up here. Um, these markings are by a later hand that as they were starting to do critical research into the, the source documents, into the Greek and into the Hebrew, Anytime that there was a variance in the documents, what they would do is they would mark them with these uh, markings in the margins. Now, obviously, we see here some staining. Um, as Dr. White puts it, probably some monk early in the morning was having his, his morning coffee or morning tea and spilled it, spilled it on the document, in which we have evidence of to this day, probably something I would do. But here, once again, we see in the second line, 
of the text. To run hoti to numa estin e alethia hoti tres estin oi martyrion tes to numa kai. What does that say? And the spirit gives evidence or uh, martyrian. Um, the spirit itself testifies three things. The tracestin um, martyrian, that, that it speaks, it gives this evidence. And the spirit says this to the These evidences, these things, basically verses 6 and 8 smushed together. What you notice here is in the fourth line, we have these critical marks that say that this is not the same reading in every document. In fact, it's not. Um, sometimes verse 8 will have a different order of words, and that's, I think, what they're seeing here. Um, sometimes martyrian is placed before the trace, talking about three, or sometimes it would be a numakai trace, estin hoi martyrian. Uh, the spirit and three give evidence to some, some of the translations. But we don't see verse seven, and these three are one here in Codex Vaticanus. Some of our earliest full manuscripts of 1 John 5 don't contain it. Let's take a look here at some of these earliest documents. This is from uh, Dr. White's website. We notice here all of these that contain the comma show up 14th to 18th centuries. 14th to 18th centuries. Now we come to the major one in which many people say, oh, well, here it is. Here's, here's where the comma comes into the stream. It's Codex Monfortianus. This, is, this has to prove that 1 John 5, 7 is real and that all these other documents are, are false, have been edited and, and are you should be used as tissue paper. Because Codex Monfortianus, written in 1520, includes the comma. We see here, trace. Estin, this is a lot harder to read than the others, even when I invert the image. Um, one of the websites in which we, you can get access to this, which is the Greek, cat, or excuse me, the German catalog of many of these documents in which have photocopies of these, you can inverse the image where they had placed a light behind it and you're able to see it in sharp contrast. Monfortianus is of the three, um, Vaticanus and Alexander, or Vaticanus, Sinaiticus and Monfortianus. Monfortianus is the hardest to read. And you notice the type of text is different. This is a later much later version of Greek. This is very much a, shall we say, a personal hand or, or a quick hand of Greek versus when you compare it to, oh, let's say, Codex Sinaiticus in Magiscule or Codex Vaticanus also in Magiscule. It, it's so much neater and more organized than Monfortianus. Monfortianus looks like doctor's handwriting to me. And the quality of the paper is not the same. The quality of the ink is not the same. Um, and it all dates to 1520. Now, does it include the comma? Yes. There are three that give witness. Uh, the spirit, 
and the word and the the Father and the Logos and the Spirit. Um, but we see that even that in and of itself is a variance from the comma that is included in the Textus Receptus, which becomes the basis for the King James Version of the Bible. In, in quoting Metzger, one of our well-respected textual critical not only authors but researchers says about the comma the passage is quoted by none of the greek fathers who had they known it would have most certainly employed it in the trinitarian controversies sabellian and the arian its first appearance in the greek is in a greek version of the latin acts of the lateran council in 1215 the passage is absent from the manuscripts of all ancient versions, we already looked at that, except the Latin, and it is not found in the Old Latin in its early form, which would have been used by Tertullian and Cyprian and Augustine, or in the Vulgate as issued by Jerome, or is revised by Alcuin. We talked about him many episodes ago. The first hand of Codex Valencianus in the ninth century. Why is it that it's absent for so long? This isn't widespread editing as our Muslim friends or our TR only friends, Texas Receptus only friends say. There, it's the gospel and the word had been spread so wide in so quick of a time. There is no way, because of a free transmission of the text, in which Christians are copying their scriptures to give to others, or translating it into a new language to include the scriptures, that there would have been evidence of it before its inclusion in the Latin in the 700s. We can see all other all other sorts of either non-editions or exclusions in Scripture, but not for 1 John 5, 7. So why was it included into the Bible? Well, let's take a look at what source documents, though, that what is called the Textus Receptus is made of. Now, as we already looked at Erasmus, and his five editions, the first two editions did not contain the comma, 5, 15, 16, 15, 19, but it was included in 1522 because, wait for it, we see that Codex Valdensius was made in 1520 and presented to Erasmus as evidence that it was con contained in a Greek document somewhere. Doesn't need to be ancient now, does it? We then also see Robert Essien, Stephanus. Um, he translates from the Latin into the Greek. It contains the comma because what? His source documents were Latin. And Latin no, no older than the 10th century. Theodore Beza had nine editions between 1565 and 1604. He uses Latin plus Codex Beze Abrigiensis, which was written in the 5th century. Doesn't contain 1st to 3rd John, period. Now, Codex Claremontanus, which Beza also uses in his editions, dating from the 5th century, doesn't include 1st through 3rd John. Codex Beze and Claremontanus only include the Gospels and Acts and some of the pastoral epistles. Doesn't include first to third John period. And then the what's called El Elzivir, which is basically a reprint of Beza, includes the comma, 
but because of the Latin and not because of the Greek. Once again, that's the latest of these quote-unquote Textus Receptus. You will see there is not a singular Textus Receptus. When someone says that they believe in the Textus Receptus, they're pointing to the Trinitarian Bible Society's 18th century version of the Textus Receptus, which was a translation of the English into the Greek reverse from the King James Version. And then they they used each of these, and each of these, you will see them online and in book form, as, for instance, um, the Novum Testamentum will sometimes be called the Textus Receptus. We see Stephanus, 1550 Stephanus Textus Receptus being called that. We see Beza's editions being called Textus Receptus. Excuse me. And we see the 1633 Elsevier version being also called the Texas Receptus. There's not a single one. And the variances and the differences between in the readings or in the order of the words between all of these editions, that's a study in and of itself. So the big question is, is what did the King James translators have on hand did they have original source Greek documents for the New Testament? We're just going to strictly look at the New Testament here. No, they had printed editions that were collated by people like Erasmus and Stephanus and Beza, who, as we already looked, Erasmus himself didn't have any earlier documents than about the 12th to 14th century. He didn't have, quote-unquote, ancient textual evidence for his translation. The same thing is true for Estian. Now, Bezo got a little bit earlier textual evidence, the 5th century, but that didn't contain a large point, portion of the New Testament in which he had to translate the rest of his Latin from other Latin translations, which once, once again none of them contained the common until after the 7th century. So then, why is there this large controversy? Well, it, it all revolves around what's called the King James Version only argument. We're going to continue this on in daylight here in just a few minutes. But my quick observation as to this, and as for my background... Many of you know that my parents took me to a hyper-Pentecostal church. And after my parents left the church, my grandparents basically grabbed me by the ear and started taking me to an independent King James only IFCA, Independent Fundamentalist Baptist Churches of America church, in which the King James is key and that if you don't have a King James, you are going to hell. Whether you believe in God, you believe in Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection, that you follow him, if you don't have a King James Bible, you are going to hell. The Textus Receptus is the only text, no matter what manuscripts are found. This is where it, it goes into that you have to have faith and trust that that is God's preserved words, period. That is the, the only true text. There are no other manuscripts, whether more are found or, or maybe some have disappeared over time. The Texas Receptus is the only text. Anything from Alexandria, Egypt is bad, has been either edited, corrupted, or is satanic. The big question there is where is the evidence? I've, I've heard this claim for decades. Where is the evidence or is this just an assertion? Where is the, the mass editing and, and quote-unquote corruption of documents from Christians? In, you know, unless you don't believe that there could have been Christians in Egypt. Oh, wait. Yes, there were. In fact, Alexandria was the hub of Christendom in the early centuries of the church. It became one of the, 
the five pillars in the early church in which many copies of the, of the God of the New Testament of the Gospels was made from Egypt and spread about the known world through there. So to claim that somehow there was a lack of Christian, true Christianity there, that, that there somehow it was corrupted or ed, purposely edited and or satanic, where's the evidence? Show me. That's why we didn't look at Codex Alexandrinus, which, by the way, also doesn't contain the comma. Or that they believe that the new the King James only translators were re-inspired when translating the King James Version. There's a bit of issues with this, and there's inconsistency. Well, then, is the canon really closed? You say, or at least the IFCA church that I went to said that, no, there's no new revelations from God. We don't add to our Bibles. And yet, the King James translators could be re-inspired to make sure that God's words are contained in the King James Version. Oh, yeah, um, by the way, um, predominantly when, hey, Dave, predominantly when looking at their source documents, King James only translators or the King James translators made a special note, if you read their introduction to the reader, that they mainly went off the Bishop's Bible. Oops! You mean they're translating from another English translation to clarify the language, not necessarily the textual Greek, Hebrew? No. That's why they only used editions of the Greek text when looking at it, and they predominantly def deferred to the Bishop's Bible and the Tyndale Bible for their translation. So then those English translations have to be inspired as well if they use them as their source, right? Well, then why can't, why couldn't others today use a Bishop's Bible or a Tyndale Bible and still be saved, so to speak? Or what about most of those that would hold to a King James argument would be cessationists, that the the Spirit doesn't do the miraculous things that it did in the earliest church today. Well, then, if the canon's closed and you don't believe that the Spirit works that way today, why is it that then the Spirit makes an exception for the King James translators? Oh, and by the way, uh, most of those that I've dealt with that have king, been King James only are independent fundamentalist Baptists who would disagree with the translators of the King James Version on many essential doctrines because they were Anglicans. Once again, I'm going to say that again. The King James translators were Anglicans. They believed in infant baptism. They believed in transubstantiation transubstantiation, their ecclesiology. They believed in priests and uh, penance and the sac uh, sacramental system, that their, their version of faith is something that is doled out to you over time and grace is doled out to you over time. Areas in which independent fundamentalist Baptists would totally disagree with those that translated the King James Version and yet it somehow re-inspired you wouldn't invite a single one of these guys to preach at your church. And yet you hold up their translation as being re-inspired. There's a little in inconsistency there. Or let's look quickly at some of the modern leaders as we prepare to go to daylight and continue this discussion. The earliest person I can find that held to a King James Version only the earliest person I could find that held to the fact that you're going to go to hell unless you have the King James Version was Charles Finney. And we already know, for those of you who have been in the Committed 100 for enough of a time, Finneyism, once again, this is where the is and the isms come in. Finney was a raging heretic, in my opinion. Finneyism has influenced the American church way too much across many denominations, especially Baptist denominations. 
um, Finney held to a King James Version only position, which then Benjamin Wilkinson, who is a Seventh Day Adventist and a very large um, speaker, shall we say, I, I wouldn't say evangelist, but speaker in America, um, also held to a King James Version only position. Who, which by the way, the others in this list would not agree with Wilkinson because he's Seventh Day Adventist including Peter Ruckman, who recently passed away. Uh, Ruckman and the Ruckmanites is probably the largest strain of the King James Version. Only advocates, um, the Ruckmanites began some of the, the harshest language towards those that use other versions of the Bible, in which it, uh, from Ruckman on, it becomes cultish. This is where the is and the isms become so steeped that uh, Ruckman would point at somebody like, uh, let's say, Billy Graham. He would point at Billy Graham and say, well, you're using the New King James or the NASB. You're going to hell. No matter your, your devotion towards the Lord, no matter your evangelism, no matter any of these other things. If you've got the wrong translation, you are going to hell. Same thing with Jack Chick, Chick's Tracks. Many of you on here, Committed to 100, probably have seen a Chick's Track or used a Chick's Track. He also would be in that Ruckmanite camp. Uh, someone who's still alive today, and I couldn't get the date of his birth. Uh, the guy who's on YouTube and doing videos advocating for uh, Texas Receptus and King James Version only. A guy named Sam Gipp who travels the world, and that's his shtick. That is his entire presentation, is on the re-inspired word that the King James Version only contains God's words and is absolutely perfect. Gail Ripplinger, which, by the way, is a female, born in 1947, who, let me change my head shot here real quick, who, by the way, started more of our modern discussion about the King James only translation as spurred on by Ruckman and others in her two books, the new age versions and which Bible is God's word. It's undergone a lot of um, changes over time, but especially in the new age versions, um, Gail Ripplinger uses things like God inspired her um, to understand Bible acrostics and and other odd things that reek of this prophetic utterances and and all of these other things in which she's heavily influenced by Ruckman Ruckmanism. But these two books have been sold widely. You will see many independent fundamentalist Baptist preachers hold up this book and say. Besides your Bible, you need this book. New Age Bible versions. Which, by the way, if we're going to talk about consistency, um, well, if you're advocating King James Version and Gail Ripplinger, you'd never invite her to come preach from the pulpit at your church. Then why advocate her book? If it goes against your doctrinal stance, why are you compromising when it comes to the fact that she advocates for the King James only? And uh, the screecher preachers, as we like to call them, Stephen Anderson, I know some of you like him. He's a raving lunatic, uh, born 1981, so he's my age. Um, uh, or is he, he, is, he is often called Stephen Slanderson because of the wild claims unsubstantiated that he has made towards Dr. White and others about their positions and their stances on the Bible, on God's word and their lifestyle. These are the, the modern leaders of King James Version only. Starting with Finney, and I can't find anything before that, in which people would say things like, the King James Version is the only word of God that you need this version. You can't get to heaven. Cultish language 
about the King James Version wasn't used until Finney. Even the King James translators themselves, if you read the introduction to the readers, they even made it plain that there would need to be other translations in the English language as language evolved, that this wasn't the be-all, end-all translation. Now, the big question as we end here and prepare to go into daylight is which King James Version are you talking about? Many say that, well, we stand upon the 1611 of the King James Version of the Bible. None of you have a 1611 King James Version of the Bible. Well, let me switch it to my face. Emphasize it here. None of you have a 16 version 11 that you can actually read. If you try and read a 1611 version of the King James Bible, you're not going to make sense because it's in Old English. It's not even in Elizabethan English that we see used later. It's almost incomprehensible. I have a 1611 in the other room. I can't read it, period. Or make understanding of really what it's saying only because I know what the, the verses say, but you, you're not using a 1611. So stop fooling yourself that you're standing upon a 1611 version of the Bible. And by the way, the King James Version of the Bible was edited and modernized in 1629, 1638, 1762, and 1769. The current editions, including the one in which I grew up on, the one I'm holding here, King James Version of the Bible, this is a 1769 Blaney revision. Even though it says King James Version, it's a 1769, not a 1611, not a 1638 or 1629 or 1762. It's a 1769 version. So which one then is the true words of God? Is it 1611? Well, you're not using it. Or the 1629? Well, you're not using that one either. Or the 1638? Oh, that's right. You're not using that one either. 1762? You're not using that one. You're using 1769. Is that the, the inspired word? But most of you say it's the 1611. Which one is it, folks? Seven core beliefs of King James Bible believers. This is taken off of a an association. Uh, a friend of mine's we, uh, church website. All Bible versions say and mean different things. Some differences matter. They are significant and affect doctrine and text and translation. These differences create a confidence problem in the hearts of God's children about his words. Modern versions are contradictory and worse, and they contain errors of facts and doctrine. God has promised to preserve his words. God has fulfilled his promise by giving us a book where we can know for sure what they are and where to find them. The King James Bible is the repository of all his words and only his words without error. Which version? What year? And the same thing from the same website. The This independent fundamentalist Baptist strain, they say that they have the blessed hope that they're Baptists and the book and the blood. This reeks to me. There's a, a phrase that I've said a time and time again. Jesus plus anything equals nothing. When you elevate your denomination to being equal with the blood of Christ, when you elevate a Bible translation to being equal with the blood of Christ. It's idolatry. Period. End of story. End of discussion. When when your dependence upon a Bible translation for salvation rather than in the one that has provided it, we have a big issue. If you guys stay tuned, just about five minutes, we'll have daylight. 
continue our discussion of these things. I wanted to make sure that we went through the evidence for the comma Johannium and discuss the issues surrounding Textus Receptus or King James Version only arguments. And uh, we'll hear from Dr. Howard, who I know uses the King James Version of the text, the school I go to, King James only. But talk about how this plays out in our churches and in our culture today. With that, see you guys in a few minutes for Daylight.